What's up, everybody? Welcome into Tom Curran's Patriots Talk Podcast. Big one today. Patriots linebackers coach Gerard Mayo. We're going to talk to him about how the season ended. Comments made by Rodney Harrison on this particular pod the other day. And his outlook for 2022. Really good stuff, I thought, looking forward and talking about the leadership on the Patriots defense. Oh, sneak peek too. later today. We're going to talk to our guy Julian Edelman. Look for that to drop tomorrow on this particular podcast channel. Enjoy. All right, here's our guy. Reunion, quick slants reunion right now. Gerard Mayo, we're bringing him in. Now, you're pitching something here. You're slinging mayonnaise. Bring in the quick. Yeah, bring me in. You're slinging no, I'm not, mayonnaise. I'm not, no, I'm not slinging mayonnaise. I partner with Hellman's Mayo to tackle food waste, and that's what it's all about. Now, absolutely, do I want you guys to buy a bunch of mayonnaise? No doubt. But we're really, the main focus is tackling food waste. And when you really think about it, 40% of the food that we take in, we waste it, right? We waste it in our refrigerators. We waste it on our countertops. And then 40% of that happens in our home. So if you think about, you know, ways to tackle food waste, it's just, you know, really just figuring out what's good and what's bad. And so that's what we're, that's what this whole program is about. How do they, uh, how do they decide on you as a spokesperson? Oh, you know what? Last night, Mayo came out of the womb. See? Came out of the womb. <laughs> Already helmets. Helmets should have been at my, they should have been at my birth. Come on, Did you say it came out of the, you know, I, I've told my wife that how once we were talking about me playing basketball and you just looked at me and you said, you were beaten at birth. I said, that was the meanest thing anybody had just said to me. And hey, if you guys are wondering what that means, it's basically saying I just didn't have the DNA to compete right. high level. That's right. Um, so, but I appreciate you. Um, listen, I want to ask you about something Rodney Harrison said to me the other day. I asked him about. Uh, his appraisal of the defense. He said, you know, Tom, it hurt. It hurt watching what happened in the playoffs. What's your response to that? Um, yeah. Playing that Bills team, they didn't punt. Uh, they, they had so much success against you previously. What do you think was the main culprit in having that happen? You know, we just came out, you know, they outcoached us, outplayed us. It was a tough game. Well, I'm not going to sit here and offer excuses. What I will say to Rodney, because, you know, this is like the third time this has come up as far as what Rodney has said in this in this regards. If you if you zoom out, right, if you zoom out on the season, I understand the recency bias, and that's what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to talk about, you know, the last the last game, of, you know, that we played. And we look terrible. If you were to look at that game without looking at the rest of the season, absolutely. <laughs> but if you were to zoom out and really look – at the season as a whole, we ended up third in points per game, which is really the most important thing. And I think like sixth or seventh as far as yards per game. And now if you go into a season saying, all right, you're going to have these numbers. Obviously, the expectation here is you always want to be number one, but number three and number seven ain't bad. And so and so when he says things like, you know, the Patriot defense is soft, when he says things like you know, the Patriot defense isn't good, I mean, it's like, all right, buddy. I know that's what you're supposed to do, but at the same time, let's look at it from let's look at it from a season wide perspective and not just a playoff perspective. But I, I totally understand it. Yeah, and, and I think too when we look at it, okay, that was the Bills and the Colts had a good team, a good running team, and I think they put up 270. I think what a lot of folks would say, and you'd say if we were working together, the teams that you guys shut down, Cleveland or Carolina or Tennessee, they were often teams that just didn't have their full array of weapons. So you guys are certainly taking care of business against those teams or did take care of business against those teams that you were presumed to be able to. It was just when you went up that weight class, it was like, holy crap. Just, I guess, I guess that's. Well, 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 well let me ahead. say something. So, so look at, let's look at the Tampa game. They had everybody, right? Yep. Let's look at a Dallas team that was stacked with talent across the board. I would say we played a pretty decent game there. It wasn't great, but it was a decent game there as well. So if you look at some of those games, I mean, we can throw games after game. But we can't, and we can't, we can't sit here and say, well, they didn't have this guy, they didn't have that guy. It is what it is. We can go out there and play against the guys that are out there on the field. So, I mean, look, yep. did, were we good enough? Absolutely not. Are we looking to get better? Absolutely. How do we get better? 
by having the free agents that we brought in have another year under their belt, under the system. They know what to expect. Drafting some players that can come in and help us right now and also developing the players. And then players that we drafted last year, really looking forward to those guys making the jump to be better players. And I'm not only talking about defense. I'm talking offense. I'm talking special mm-hmm. teams. Because when you look at this team, we need guys to develop and step into roles, right? And not only roles as football players, but also roles in the locker room roles at you know roles in the locker room roles as far as leadership on the field like we need guys to step up and that's going to be that's going to be our rally cry this year i want to stick on that but i do want to mention the, the best game you guys played as a team was the san diego's the Chargers game i keep it to san diego crap yeah because even when the offense got bogged down in in tight and didn't score on a fourth and goal from the one you guys got on the field defensively and you forced a three and out against the team with eckler Justin Herbert, um, you know, Mike Williams and, and, you know, Keenan Allen, that was, that was a full array of weapons they had. That was the best game. And that's why I think people like me or people who were fans will look at it and say, see, that's, that's why this team should be the number one seed. They're so solid in all those different, different areas. And then for the last tail portion of the season to end the way it did, is it hard for you guys to zoom out and not kind of suck on that last five games and say, wow, we really sucked. We have a long way to go. How do you, how do you process it? I guess. Yeah. You know, honestly, as a player, I'll, t- I'll take it from two different perspectives here as a player, you, you definitely think about that last game and use that as, as motivation, you know, throughout this, uh, throughout the off season, as far as training and things like that, from a coach's perspective, you look at that game, but you also have to zoom out. And we'll look at each and every single play, offense, defense, and special teams, and break down each and every individual on the field, play call, situation, and things like that, and really zoom out to see what we can do better schematically. But look, when you look, I'll just be honest with you. When you look at that last game, take it off the, put it, you could put it on me, and I feel like I'm okay. We just didn't go out there and perform the way we needed to do. And as a coach, as a coach, I feel like it's my job. I feel like it's the coach's job to get these guys ready to play, whether it's X's and O's or whether it's just the energy ready to go out there and play a football game at a high level. We had that conversation a bunch uh, on our set with Ted Johnson, and I've always felt that a lot of folks will put it on coaches to have a guy ready, to have him playing at a fever pitch or focused. And I often look at that and say, man, aren't they getting paid a lot? I mean, don't they pour their lives into it? They have one game, isn't it? Doesn't it start with the players to be ready? Where do you feel as a guy who's been both? Yeah, it definitely starts with the players, and they are professionals. If you talk to a lot of the older guys, they will tell you that. But when you look at a locker room, there's also a generational shift happening, right? The same generational shift that happened when Hightower was coming in with me or myself coming in with Brew, right? There's a So these are different guys that we're dealing with, and these guys are still trying to learn how to really be professionals. Even guys that are young guys that have come from other teams, like, mm-hmm. you just got to make sure these guys are in the right frame of mind. That doesn't mean giving a rah-rah speech. That's not what I'm talking about. What I mean is just making sure they're solid on the game plan, they're solid on the tools that we want to use on the field, and they're out there playing fast. And so that's what I mean when I get to say get guys ready. I'm not talking about a pump-up speech or anything like right. that. Like, really, you don't need that. But you need to have these guys be able to go out there and play fast and not be paralyzed <laughs> through analysis because we watch so much film. Go out there and, and use that, your natural athleticism and play ball. Yeah, so I think there's a perception, too, that when guys, people say they're not ready, it's like, oh, well, game day, let's go. And it's not as much as, okay, you got to get up and down the court a couple times to get a few shots to get the sweat going to let the game declare. And that's why we see first possession touchdowns or scores on either side so frequently in the NFL. Teams have prepared all week for that's that right. first possession. Um that's right. And that it was just maybe sometimes a tick slow. Who are the leaders going to be? Duggar, I would imagine. Judon is yep. a newer guy. Phillips. I, I always believe that, you know, that type of leadership starts in the offseason. It starts in the weight room, right? It starts in the offseason program, the phase one, phase two, phase three. That's where that leadership uh, starts. And I, I honestly don't know. But what I will say is that the cream eventually rises to the top. Like my grandfather used to tell me, the cream will eventually rise to the top. And whoever those leaders are, hopefully they, they're your better players, right? Hopefully they're your better players and they can bring everyone else along with them. 
We talk about cream rising to the top. Nobody spends more time tooting the horn if Gerard Mayo is a head coaching candidate than I do um, I for a variety it. of reasons. Now, it's, I think people spend a lot of time worried about who's a coordinator for a successful team, and they don't understand that the most important thing, in my estimation, isn't bringing the hot coordinator in and having him oversee a team. You're taking him away from his position of strength. It's bringing in a cultural person who can impact everybody. And the only reason I say that is I worked with you. I understand the impact you can have on a group of employees. All that said, so there's my rub down to you. Um, <laughs> oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> what do you, uh, how was the experience interviewing for head coaching? There's an awful lot of layers here. First, um, did you feel you got a fair shake with the Raiders job? You know, I, I'm not going to get too far into the fair shake and, you know, the whole, you know, beef flow thing yet. But what, I will say, but what I will say is I looked at all of these interviews as growing opportunities for me. I looked at our growth opportunities for me. I went into these interviews saying I'm going to put my best foot forward. Whatever happens, happens. But it's not going to be because I didn't put my best foot forward. And so I feel like, I, you know, I showed I showed out as far as, you know, whatever you want to talk about philosophy. You want to talk about X's and O's, all that stuff. I nailed all this, which I thought uh, was enough to at least get to a finalist role. But obviously it wasn't. And which I'm, I'm fine with it. But you got to think about it. No matter what industry we're talking about, there will always be uh, candidates that have like an edge on someone else. Right. Like they have some type of relationship, whether they worked mm -hmm. with them in the past or whatever. I don't have that because my circle is here in New England. Right. But now going back to what we just talked about, I, I can absolutely see the frustration from a guy like Leslie Frazier, from a guy like B enemy. I can see the frustration from a guy like Todd Bowles, all those guys that have been doing this for you know 20 plus years and not getting the opportunities uh, that they think they deserve. But from my perspective, a guy who's only been coaching three years, you know, I'm not mad about it. I look at it as a learning opportunity. I looked at it as an opportunity to talk to other people about football. And also, they weren't interviewing me. Little did they know I was interviewing them as well, right? Because this is a very small circle. And I just got to get inside of that circle and really continue to foster these relationships and nourish these relationships. There's obviously ambiguity, and Bill likes it that way, with the titles and as a result of there not being a title, there's ambiguity as to what the division of labor is um, on the Patriots' defensive side of the ball. Is it Gerard? Is it Steve? Is it Bill? Is it a, a all by committee? Can you explain how it all divvies up? Look, I, I would just say this. Steve and I have a great working relationship. We have a great working relationship, even a great off the field relationship. Uh, we do a lot of things together. Um, he has his strengths. I have my strength, but that whole defensive staff, we work together to come up with the game plan. Look, and at the end of the day, Bill's the head coach. If he comes in there and says, I don't like this, I like this, then that's what it is. And so there is some, there is collaboration to it. Now, if you guys want to point blame at something, like, I don't care who you point, you can point the blame at me. It doesn't oh, it's not matter. even no. blame. It's just trying to figure out who's doing what over there sometimes. Yeah, I mean, but, think about, but think about this, though. Like, even when Flo was here, he was never the defensive coordinator. Even when Matty P was here, it took a long time for him to become the defensive coordinator to get that title. So this is something that historically has been this way for a long time. I know, but you could see the imprint. When Matt left, you could see the imprint of the Flores mark on that defense in 2018. It became much more aggressive. Um, well, Steph Gilmore was in his second year, too. There were a lot of different factors, but That's right. we're, pushing, uh, we're pushing up against the time. Um now, we're going to do this again. I want to do this again because this is a longer conversation. Okay, because I guess my last question is, when we look at the quarterbacks you guys have to deal with, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow, on and on and on, what does the Patriots defense need to do or add to deal with those guys? Is it scheme? Is it speed? Is it being amorphous? What do you got? I think it's a combination of the two. I will say this. We will always be a game plan defense. Uh, we're definitely always looking to get faster and to get more playmakers on the field. So that's definitely something. You know, they have a lot of playmakers on the offensive side of the ball as well. So we have to be able to match up. We'll see what happens with free agency in the draft. But we, need, we have to have the firepower. We have to have the scheme as well. But at the end of the day, those guys are going out there on the field uh, to play a game. So. All right, don't run out of energy. You still got more uh, food waste <laughs> to talk about. Uh, okay. Appreciate the folks at Hellman's and appreciate you, my guy. All right, thanks, bro. Good to see you. We'll talk later. You too, buddy. Take care.